theme song for the year. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's good to see you this morning. Hope you brought your coat. I left my house this morning early. It was like 65 degrees. By the time I get home, it'll be about 25 degrees. So praise the Lord in spite of all those things. By the way, we start a new lift group study today in uh, our lift groups based upon the sermon series that I'm preaching. For a few months, our elders were busy working on this particular workbook that they're going by. It's our study guide called Faith in Action. Now, you don't need this workbook. They may give you some of the sheets out of it through the lesson occasionally at their discretion. But what you do need is this particular workbook. We'll be delving deeply into this. You'll need to bring a ready heart, your Bible, a notebook, and be ready to hear from God. Now, what I'm encouraging each of you to do, and this would be good for your New Year start anyway, this book of James is such a fascinating book on a practical walk in life in Jesus Christ and practical faith in Christ. I want to encourage you that for this whole month, you read the book of James. Uh, five days out of the seven, I trust that you will take and read one chapter of the five chapters each day. All right, pretty simple. Take a couple minutes, just add it to your quiet time, whatever. James chapter one on Monday, James chapter two, you know, however you want to do it, start on Sunday, go through Friday, however. But one chapter per day, and then next week you do the same thing again, the next week the same thing again, the next week the same thing again. By reading it about four times like that, you will get the message, I think, eventually. Uh, there's so much in the Word of God, you just can't get on over one reading like that. But I want to encourage you to take some time with it. The second week that you read it through, sit down with your pencil and paper. Take notes and then do so and build on that. And by the time you finish the month, you'll have your own workbook on faith and action out of the book of James. So I want to encourage you to do that. I want to encourage you to participate in lift groups this week and this month because it will be something that will help you immensely. Especially for those who are, are believers, have made commitments in the Lord in regard to this new year and your dis disciplines and your walk with Christ. I always think that new year time, end of year, beginning of year, good times for introspection, good times to make sure that we are where we need to be in our walk with Christ. So I, I hope and trust that you will... Uh, take very serious this, this particular study. As we get into the book of James, uh, I'll leave some of the more introductory kind of comments and things to, our, to, your, to your lift group leaders, other than to say just a couple of things. One, the author, James, and two, the, the, the basic message of the book. Uh, there are about four guys in the New Testament named James, all right? A lot of people thought for the first three centuries of the church that this letter was written just titled James and not much more an, an insight to it than that, that it was written by James, uh, uh, one of the apostles. Uh, then uh, as time goes on and James the Apostle passes away, it appeared that he passed away before the book was written, all right? So it couldn't be him. The other suspected author of this time was James, the half-brother of Jesus, who was also the pastor of the Church of Jerusalem. And most theologians since the third century have agreed on the, on the, the context, at least the writer being uh, that particular one, the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the leader of the Jerusalem Church, uh, remember that uh, the persecution began uh, after the, the ascension of Jesus. The persecution set in greatly. Many of the Christians in Jerusalem were being dispersed among. And then you bring in, uh, in the uh, mid-late 30s, the Romans invaded Jerusalem, left it devastated. That began what was called the diaspora, or the dispersion of the Jews around the known world. James is writing this letter to those believing Jews, those who'd committed their life to Christ, on how they can deal with the persecution that began so, so, so radically, began after the death of Stephen. And he's writing to them and basically saying, you know, encouraging them uh, and exhorting them and instructing them in regards to their walk with God and their commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, how to deal with the issues that were facing them as believers. And it's a very strong commitment to uh, how to deal with the persecution, temptation, issues within the body and their own, their own life. So it's a great book of study, and it's a great study in, in just getting our faith in action. What we profess and what we say we believe and possess becomes a matter of our practice as well. Beliefs mean really nothing if they're not lived out. Beliefs, you know, it, it's, it's just a waste of time to even uh, sit around and tell what you believe if it's not a reality in your life. It's not really a belief. In fact, that word belief, uh, the English word comes from an old English term uh, which meant to, to live by something. It's what I live by. It's what I believe. I, 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 it's what I, I believe this, all right? And so that's the idea behind the letter as well, that our actions are taking place. We're going to begin in, in James chapter 1, of course, with our study in James. And let's look about the first eight verses, and then I'm going to jump into a few more verses that are following that, 12, 13, and 14. But it begins like this. 
James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete and lacking in nothing. Now, if you, any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Now the theme of this particular section of scripture deals with temptation. How do you deal with it? What, what, what's going on with temptation? Now, uh, let me ask you, how many of you were tempted this week? Just raise your hand briefly. Oh, come on, quit lying. How many were tempted this week? Let's get more specific. How many were tempted this morning? <laughs> all right, the rest of you are just flat lying or you hadn't woke up just yet, all right? Maybe you were tempted to go back to bed. And <laughs> that was a temptation in itself. Uh, now, we think we, we really don't need any instruction on temptation. We're, we're pretty much uh, specialists in this regard, right? We're, we're professionals. We know about temptation. But let me just quiz you real quick to see just how much you know about temptation. Because sometimes we think we've arrived in some regard and we don't know nothing. Amen? Here, here's the test. When you were tempted this week or this morning, how many of you just threw a party and said, praise God, this is exciting. I can't believe this is happening right now. This is fantastic. Raise your hand. See, you don't know anything about temptation. You thought you knew, but you didn't. Because he says here, my brethren, which means sister as well, count it all joy when you encounter various trials and temptations, right? Count it what? Joy. No, no. What kind of joy? All joy. Now, how many of you got what you wanted for Christmas? Did you count it all joy? Some of you went beyond that. You just freaked out, right? You counted it all joy. You were excited about it. When you count something all joy, what do you do? You, you know, it's, it's a Yahoo time. It's, it's, it's praise the Lord time. You, you know, you, you text it to your friends. I, you know, it's, I just, this happened, you know. You, you put it on Facebook. I know what you do. You know, you, you put toast on your Facebook. Right. Pictures of it. So you Post, you're counting it all joy. I mean, I mean, tweet, hashtag Yahoo. You know, that's, that's what you do when you count something all joy. You get excited about it. Now, if we say we know about temptation, but yet we don't get excited, we don't know about temptation. Because when we do understand the context of what the Bible tells us about temptation, and when we're tempted and really get it, we will Yahoo. You know, it'll be totes, my goats, or whatever else you write out there. It's going to be exciting, you know. It's going to be, it, this, is, this is cool. Look what's happening in my life. I'm being tempted. Can you, this is great. You say, well, that's not what happened in my life. Then you don't get it yet, amen. So we're going to talk about temptation today. And we're going to look at six questions. And we'll deal with this a little bit deeper in our particular lift group studies. When we look at these questions today, question number one will be, we can going to turn the page too soon. Uh, why are we tempted will be question number one. I did miss the list, all right. Anyway, just leave that one there, Larry, because sometimes it'll do that. Question one will be, why are we tempted? Question number two, what is temptation? The next question we'll look at this morning, what is the source of temptation? The fourth is this, what is Satan's method that he uses in tempting me? And then is there a right way or a legitimate way to satisfy my temptations? And number six will be, what are the results of going God's way versus the results of going Satan's way? When I am tempted. Now we'll go over those six as we go through the, the lesson today. The first is this. Why are we tempted? It's a good question. And that's probably the first thing we need to settle on this issue. Why are we tempted? Simply put, he says here, knowing that the testing or the trying of faith works patience. It's, it, it produces endurance and that it's have its perfect work. That You may be perfect or mature and complete, lacking in nothing. He says you ought to be excited because you understand what's happening when you're tempted. What's really going on when you're tempted? If you understand that, and you understand all the good that comes out from being tempted and going God's way in the temptation, then you ought to be excited about what's going on. It means that God's up to something in life. God's doing something in life. N number one, let me put it this way. It, it, it conforms us to the, I know these sub the subtitles are coming up, so why don't you move it over to the PowerPoint section and, and restart it, point one for me. Anyway, we're, what happens when I'm tempted is what the Lord is doing, we'll see in this context there, the passages, 
He's conforming me to the image of Jesus Christ. He's, he's seeking to make me more like Jesus. Every time I'm tempted, it's an opportunity where God is pressing me in, conforming me to, maturing my life in Jesus Christ. Basically, and I, you've probably heard me say it before, nobody has done more for me in regard to uh, my spiritual depth, in regard to me growing in Christ, obviously than the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the Word of God. But outside that, next in line, for who has done more for me, and you if you realize it, in growing you in Christ Jesus, is the devil. Because every time he puts his ugly head up, it ought to be the very thing that runs us to Jesus Christ. When he appears on the scene, our response should not be to follow him, but to forsake him and follow Jesus Christ. So we, we, this is con real, I mean, this is kind of what he's saying here. Temptation should be the thing that runs us to Jesus Christ. And in so doing, it will produce endurance in our life. It'll produce maturity in our life. God can do something deeper in my life. Literally, he's saying it's God's way of making you holy. It's God's way of making you holy. There's not going to be any maturity in my life unless I get to this place. So you say, how, well, let me wrap my head around that. Why are we tempted to make me more like Jesus? Then let's look at the second part is, number two would be, what is temptation? Now, James very simply calls it the trying of your faith. It's the trying of your faith. Now, in, in the context of that, you say, oh, you're trying my faith. That mean I'm going uh, to be tested to see if I, if I mean business or not. That's not the kind of trying we're talking about here. It, it's, it's, that's, that's not what we're dealing with. It's not testing something to see if it will fail, but it's testing something to reveal the progress. Testing something to show where it's at, what, what the strength of it is. In fact, the American Standard Version puts it like this, knowing that the proving of your faith, to prove something, when uh, designers sit down and develop a new airplane, uh, they'll sit down and all the engineers and scientists sit down together uh, and they'll draw the plans out and they draw it according to what, well, the law of aerodynamics and all the things that had to be dealt with and the engineers will go over the mechanics of it all and we say on, on paper, hey, this thing's going to fly. And we know it'll fly. How good it'll fly will be something else. And so we put a test schedule together and we have test pilots. Those are the suckers. No, excuse me. <laughs> those, those are the test pilots. They're, what are they gonna, they're going to not test it so much to see if it works. We know it's going to work. It's how, how good it's going to work. Where's it at in its progress? And literally the idea of this it means to test something for the sake of, of development, to see where it's at, to check it, to modify it. For what reason? For success. So that it can be everything it's intended to be. And literally for the Christian, it gets back to what Joseph said to his brothers, what you intended for evil, God meant for good, right? And it's the same thing here with temptation. What Satan will intend for deception and ruin and death and misery and pain and condemnation, God says, I'm just going to take that and reverse it and put it in his face and grow you through it and make you deep in your life. Basically, the idea gets down to this. It's, uh, it says that you can be entire, perfect, lacking nothing. Literally, it's a terminology that has to do with maturity. So in the context of what he's saying here, if temptation is to establish this in Christ, then we realize then, you know, there's, 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 there's no maturity, there's no holiness, there's no growing, there's no developing, there's no being what God's called me to be, there's no success in my Christian life without temptation. If I understand that, then I can just use a little logic at this point. What do I want more than anything else? I want to be like Jesus. What do you want more than anything else? You want to be a godly man, a godly woman. Because, all right, I'll provide for that. And here's the way we're going to do it. I know you will succeed. I know you're built right. I know you've been engineered right. You're in Christ. You have everything you need. You have everything you could ever hope for in Jesus Christ. So you will succeed. Now let's prove it. Let's show it. Let's, let's, let, let's see it happen. And the more that you go through this, then the stronger you'll become. The consistency, the maturity, the patience will develop. In fact, by the word patience, remember, we, we, we don't mean grin and bear it. That's why a lot of people think patience, patience in action is one, two, three, you know, counting to ten kind of thing. That's not patience, all right? Patience means consistent. Patience means steady. 
Patient means that you're not up and down like that spiritual basketball, in and out, up and down, hot and cold. What's happening, it may be like that in the very first stages of your spiritual walk in life, but the more that you grow with Christ and the more that you go on with Christ, guess what's happening? Hey, there's, there's more consistency is taking place and you're getting deeper and, and you're going farther with Christ and you're going higher and you're going, your, your life's getting broader in Christ and all the things that you desire to be in Christ, that's happening. So if that's true, whoop it up. <laughs> Throw a party. Be excited because God's doing something in my life. Just to know God's moving my life. Hey, that's a good sign. Some people say, I just don't know where God is. Hey, you being tempted? God's, God's right there. Now, understand, we talk about this. The third question, we said, what is the source of temptation? The source of temptation, remember, it's not from God. He allows it. He, Satan's going to move against you. So he'll take what Satan is seeking to destroy you and use it to make you holy and to make you righteous, and to make you all that God desires you to be. But the Bible says that God tempts no man. God tempt, doesn't tempt anybody. Now, a lot of people go back to Genesis 22 and they'll say, what do you mean God, God tempts no man? The Bible says in Genesis 22, 1, that God tempted Abraham. God tempted Abraham. Again, you've got to look at the, that's the English translation of a Hebrew word. All right? We, it, it wasn't a very good translation of a Hebrew word. It's, it is the Hebrew word Nisai, which it literally means to prove something, to put something to a test, to prove it. To show that it is what it is. And what it is, this was Abraham's opportunity to prove he's a man of God. To stand up. Not to see if he would fail, not just to show that he would succeed if he followed God. He'd be what God wanted to be, a man of faith. The Greek word is similar, but it's the word perezo. And it pretty much is the whole idea of proving something to show that it, that it is the genuine, true article. Proving something. That, that, that's why Jesus was tempted. The Bible says God cannot sin. Jesus couldn't sin. But why was he tempted? To prove he's the son of God. You go buy a diamond. You start walking in the store and say, let me see a diamond. That's a diamond. Okay, I'll tell you. Do you ever uh, look at a diamond? Do you, do you know you're getting a diamond? How do you know you're getting a diamond? Somebody be looking down at your ring and say, oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they told me it was a diamond. Hey, let's have some facts and proof. We can scratch some glass with it. It'll be a diamond, right? We can prove it's a diamond. But how are you going to do that? There's going to be some pressure. There's going to be some friction. There's going to be an action taking place. But the result of the pressure and the pain and the friction is going to be the evidence. The proof, it's a diamond. God tempts no man with evil, the Bible says, nor is he tempted of evil. We think in the context of this that it means to excite to sin. You know, that's what Satan's trying. He's just trying to, to, to stir up something to, to get me to sin. Well, God doesn't do that. That's not the way that God works in your life. Somebody told me that right after I got said, well, you know, you know as soon as you leave here, you know, you're, you're going to be tempted and God, God's going to see if you really mean business or not. God knows if I'm in business. All right? And so if the trial comes, it's not to say if I mean business, it's to push me farther and closer and deeper in my walk with Jesus Christ. And so I, if I get the proper mindset about what this is all is, is about, then I can rejoice. So this proving and this testing and thinning comes to do deepening work, to, to experience the reality of Jesus in my life, and I really believe even to create a deeper confidence in Christ, that he's trustworthy, and I know he is trustworthy. So we decide right here now who, who's doing this tempter. It's obviously Satan who is the tempter and his desire is to deceive and to trick for the purpose of my ruin or failure in my life. But on the other hand, God will take what he's doing and he'll test my progress and he'll prove where I'm at. He's not out to deceive me at all. He's out to draw me closer to himself and deepen my life and rich in my walk with him. It's the idea of proving something to improve something. If you got that, say uh-huh. So that's the source of temptation is the enemy. Now, the fourth question is, what is Satan's method used in temptation? What's, what's the method that, that, that he, he uses? You know, once we decide that he's the tempter, how, how, does, how does it work? Well, verse 13 and 14 talks about how, how you know, that every man is tempted when he's draw away, drawn away of his own lust, it says in King James. Uh, I think one, another translation says of his own desires. In fact, that's a better translation, desire over lust. Because it's the very same word in the Greek language that Jesus used when he met with his disciples in the upper room and he sat down at the table with them and he said, I have desired to have this Passover with you. The same word. So it's not lust in the context of, uh, we think of an immoral sense to excite to sin, some sexual pleasure, sexual sin. But to, it, that's, that's not what it's about. It, but it, it has to do with our desires. 
And every man is tempted when he's drawn away of desires. We have desires and drives in our life. And you'll notice on the overhead, there's a, and we put it back up now, there's this rope there. That's about the simplest picture I could give of what it's like. Our life is like a rope. Just all these strands and all these desires and all these drives go through it. And they're natural given normal drives. You say, what are you talking about? How many of you were hungry this morning? Right? You get hungry. That's a natural, normal, God-given desire. All right? That's a natural, normal, God-given appetite and desire that you have. And it's given to you. Well, you, you can't live, you don't eat. So God put that in you. You, you get hungry. You get thirsty. Uh, you have all kinds. I, I believe there's a worship drive in, in our life, you know, that God has placed there. That it's, it's, it's there. That God's given it to everybody. And everybody satisfies that drive. In a righteous way or an unrighteous way. We worship God. We worship ourselves. We worship money. We worship popularity. We worship opinion. But it, it, it's, it's there in our life. I believe there's a creative drive. I believe there's an approval drive. I, I believe there's a, a success drive. We'll satisfy it. We'll, we, want it. we want to achieve. We want to succeed. God put that in us. What, what's it there for? It's to find our success first and foremost in Christ Jesus. All these things in our life, but it's, it's like a baby when they're born. They have everything necessary for life and they have all these muscles in their body, but they can't walk yet. They can't crawl yet, you know. They can't take care of themselves yet. And what happens as, if, as natural and normal growth takes place in the physical sense, the muscles begin to develop and the muscles begin to mature. Now for us in, in humanity, because we are all sinners, all these drives and all these passions are like weak muscles in an infant child, all right? Once we're saved, we have the capacity to do what we're supposed to do. Without Christ, we're lost, all right? That, that's a good terminology for people who don't know Jesus. Lost, all right? There's no hope. But when we come to Christ, we're made into new creatures. And now these, these desires like these strands and muscles and fibers running through, they need to be matured. They need to be sanctified. So there needs to be spiritual growth. So I don't satisfy these desires in my life in an unrighteous way. By the way, we, we all have a, a, a sex drive, all right? Every one of us. There's this, there's this drive that God naturally and normally put that desire in you for the maintenance of the human race, okay? There's this drive, there's, there's this desire. Satisfy it in a righteous way is what the Bible tells us, and there'll be blessings and grace and, and, and beauty and glory. Satisfy it in an unrighteous way, there's nothing but pain and misery and death. Well, what's the righteous way? The Bible says in marriage the bed is undefiled. All right? So in a marriage relationship, you can satisfy that desire. Outside of marriage, the Bible says don't go there. All right? What does Satan do? Well, all these God-given drives and desires that God's given can be satisfied. Uh, let me do this now, all right? Back it up to that one. Temptation, basically, is Satan getting... I said, don't touch it. <laughs> Go back now to the other page. Thank you very much. What Satan does, he comes and appeals to these drives... That, no, it's still not going to work, all right? He's not going to... He, just, just turn it off. He appeals to these drives and these desires, and he seeks to get you to satisfy these God-given drives in a God-forbidden manner, yes. all right? He wants you, to, he wants you to, to, to take this appetite, this passion, this drive, whatever it might be, whether it's hunger, sex, whatever it might be, worship, creativity, aesthetics, whatever it might be, whatever it could be, he wants you to satisfy that in a God-forbidden way, a way that's against the way God wants you to do it. That's temptation. You, you, it comes in, this thought comes and you have this desire that's is stirred up. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own passions, his own desires. It's stirred up. He approaches that. A thought comes and we have to make this decision. But here's the problem. As God is seeking to sanctify us and refine us and build us up, choices have to be made. Now, some of you are the first of the year, you, you did what you did last year and you said, I'm going to lose weight. We won't ask for a show of hands. I'm going to lose some weight. I'm going to give her some weight. Well, you don't wish it away, right? And I love some of these pills, these pills that are advertised. Take this pill. You can keep eating the way you've been eating. Your lifestyle never changes and you will lose weight. Yeah. Or probably die in the process too. But, it, you know, you have to make some choices and, 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 and some exercise is required. If you really want to, you're going to have to exercise. You're going to have to get off your lazy behind and do something, all right? You're going to have to get up. You're going to have to walk. You're going to have to stretch. You're going to have to move around. You need to get active, all right? But here's what happens. If you've been inactive and you start being active, 
Oh, man, it hurts. It hurt. Some of you started your New Year's resolution in word, but not in action yet. Okay, we're here. This is the fifth. Get up, move around, walk, stretch, bend over, toe bends, whatever, you know. Move around. But what happens? You say, brother, I'm sore. Let me tell you what. You're not sore yet. Day three is when you're sore. In fact, if you don't exercise on day two and three, you're still sore. And you're still just as miserably sore. So you might as well go ahead and exercise. Why? Because you're exercising things that hadn't been exercised in a long time. But what happens is you exercise them. And as you do what you know you're supposed to be doing, then something begins to take place. There's this endurance begins to build. I remember I had a motorcycle accident years ago, even before I met Christ. And the doctor told me, as he's stitching it all back together, my knee and joints in there, he says, you know, uh, you're going to you're gonna have to do some physical therapy. We're going to give you some instructions. And you need to do these every day for the next, you know, 10 weeks at least. Uh, you know, this thing's going to lock up and you're going to have a limp on this side of your leg. Well, I took him very serious. I went right home and started acting. That hurt. And the next day it hurt. And the next day it hurt. And it hurt. You know? Some, some of you, you know, you need... You need you don't realize that, yeah, I know what I need to do, but when it starts hurting, you, you, you give up. You don't stop because it hurts. It'll go away. What will happen is through the exercise, you will develop endurance. And you'll be able to walk around the house without losing your breath. And then the block. And then down the street. And then maybe even jog a little. Or bicycle. You develop endurance and you can take it and you breathe and you feel better. I think, it, you know, uh, Here's what Paul said. Bodily exercise profits a little. It's, 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 a prof, it's profitable. He said, but here's where you need to really exercise. You need to exercise yourself unto godliness. How do I do that? Well, praise God. He is so committed to you. Every day he takes you to the gym. Every day exercise time comes. Every day, every morning, every evening, exercise time comes. And it comes in the form of temptation. But I want to get better. I want to get stronger. I want to be consistent. I want to be deeper. I want to have some, some maturity in my spiritual life. So I can praise God that God's bringing me to the gym every day. Because this is God's method. It's God's way, he says here. Now, here's the thing about it. We, we enter in to the temptation and Satan comes and he appeals to these weak muscles and to these drives in our life. And so I choose now to, to exercise. And by the way, let me give you a good definition for faith. It's kind of one of them holy rabbit trails. Faith is simply following God in each temptation, in every situation. Faith is simply following God in every situation. And temptation comes there is a way to satisfy that. There is a way to do something about that. Now, let me ask this question. Is there, number five, is there a right way and a legitimate way to satisfy my temptations? The answer is yes. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, you know, there's no temptation taking you, but such as common to man. In other words, everybody's tempted. But God will, with every temptation, make a way of escape that you may be able to endure it so you can grow by it, so you can be stronger from it. So you can progress through it. Every, everybody's tempted. You can't say, well, brother, you don't know my, you know, you don't, you don't know my temptation. You don't know what to do. Hey, that's a cop out. Yes. You know, you think that you're special. Nobody in the world's just like you. Nobody in the world goes through what you go through. Everybody goes through it. All right. On some level, at some time, everybody's going to face it in some way. But God is faithful. And that's a good term, man. God's faithful. With every, with it, with it, with it. Here's temptation, here's God. Here's temptation, here's the way. He said, brother, well, well, you know, if there's a legitimate way to satisfy every temptation, how do I satisfy this one? Verse five, ask. And by the way, this is in the context of temptation. If any man lack wisdom. Now we think that's in regard to a business decision, marriage, whatever. But in, in context, and it is, we should ask wisdom everything. But in context, it's about temptation. You don't know what to do? You don't know what to do? Then ask God. Boy, so much comes by prayer, doesn't it? So much just comes by talking to the Father and going to Him and seeking His faith. He said, but you need, just need to ask God. God, I don't know what to do. I've been tempted. I'm failing consistently. What am I going to do? But he says, but, oh, by the way, he puts this little addendum. And when you ask, if you want an answer, ask in faith. Nothing wavering. What's that mean? What did we say faith was? 
Faith is following whatever God tells you to do, right? So that means I go to God and I say, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. That's just simply, but that's a Jorm's translation. Ask God and tell God you'll do whatever he tells you to do. Don't say, well, God, you tell me what it is first, I'll make my mind up. You can't say, God, oh, you want me to diet? No. <laughs> Not that. You want me to exit? No. No, he said, whatever it is, God tells you, do you do that. Ask in faith, and God who is faithful, remember, with every temptation, that faithful God will give it to you, a bunch of it, liberally. Won't hold it back without reproaches. You know what that means? He's not going to do a bunch of fault finding when you ask him. He's not going to say, it's about time you ask. I can't believe you're so stupid. <laughs> Are you such a moron that you've waited to now to ask? <laughs> He's not going to do that. Won't be reproach coming. He'll give you an answer that you need, that you're looking for, but you ask in faith means you'll get it because you're committed to do whatever it says to do. He said, if you're not, then you're just an unstable individual. We like to use that terminology a lot. He's an unstable person. Well, you know who an unstable person is? This person is double-minded. The person who's not willing to do what God tells them to do in their life, they're unstable. He says, you used to ask God. Now, here's the thing about it. When I ask God, it says, if I go God's way, he says, and he that does this and follows the Lord and asks in faith, he'll receive the crown of life. In verse 12, it says, What's the crown of life? I, I, there's lots of crowns, and we talked about them in, in previous sermons before. We talked about judgment seat and all those things. But there's, there's lots of crowns that you can, you can get in heaven. But I believe this crown of life is probably more reserved for today and now. If there's an area where you're being tempted, maybe even failing in, you keep failing, God wants to, to crown your life in that area. God wants you to have grace in that area. God wants to strengthen you in that area. And he says, you need, you need to ask God what to do. In fact, when you get to the point of asking, this would be a good exercise. Lord, I really need wisdom. You know, and he's going to talk about the results of going each way in just a moment of temptation. God, I need wisdom. He said, if I ask you, give it to me. So, God, I want to know what to do. But I want you to take just a moment when you get to that point and you start considering what God says to do, even though it may be difficult. Realize that if you'll do what's difficult, think for a moment, imagine even. I mean, just think it in your mind, play it out in your heart and mind. If I do what God says to do, where's that going to lead me in the long run? Versus... If I do what Satan is tempting me to do and appealing to me to do, where is that going to lead in the long run? The result of going God's way is, is the crown of life. Verse 14 tells us the result of going Satan's way, that alternative way, that's death. It's misery. So as I'm praying about it, I think, here's, where I'm, here's my struggle is right now. This is where I'm tempted right now. Here's what I'm going to ask God what to do, and I'm going to do what God says. If I, if I go God's way, boy, every time I've obeyed God, it's been a blessing. Amen? Every time I've obeyed God, ultimately brings fullness of joy. Every time I obey God, there's freedom. Every time I obey God, man, just to go to God in prayer, I'm not wading through all this self-condemnation because I've junk in my life. And he's not going to answer my, you know, the Bible says that unstable guy's not going to get his prayers answered, all right? So I'm going to God, and I know I'm right with God. I'm, my heart's clean. I'm confessed up. You know, thank, there's just joy. There's victory. There's peace. And then there's a confidence that knowing that God's hearing me. Isn't that good to know that when I pray, I know God's hearing me? I, I, there's times I prayed, I wasn't quite sure. I, I know he hears, but I knew it. here in the context of responding, you know, I wasn't sure we're going to get that. Think about the other direction, the way that leads to death. You like that over there? But it felt so good for a moment pleasure and sin for a season but look at the pain it brought you look at the pain it brought others look at the death and destruction that's being done in your own heart and your own life think about that feeling of condemnation and guilt y'all know what that's like don't you, you just feel guilty I, I'm, I'm, I'm not big on that how about you you know i don't like you know wallowing in shame wallowing in defeat i, I mean seriously you need to consider this there's two ways here all right and there are ways that seem right in a man, but they lead to death. What is God's way, not my way? And if I go God's way, man, that's good stuff. Go, and it may be difficult at times. It may be hard choices, but it still ends good. Over here, it's just death. I satisfied a little itch for a little bit, huh? But I'm miserable. And I'm empty. And I'm defeated. There's no confidence in my prayer life. There's no witness for the glory of God. And if I do, I'm putting on a hypocritical show, pitiful show. So James is telling us, maybe we don't know so much about temptation. Maybe we need to stop and consider. Yeah, it may feel good for the moment, but that satisfaction is so fleeting and it is so temporary because when sin is conceived, it brings forth death. 
And death, we've said before in Scripture, never means to just cease being. It means separation. We're, we're, we're dead in our trespasses and sin. I'm still being, right? I'm alive. I'm not alive spiritually. I'm alive physically, emotionally, mentally. I'm missing the essence of life. But, you know, ultimately, I am dead because I'm separated from God. There's no life, real life apart from him. And sin, when it's conceived in my heart, always brings death in relationships. It brings division. It brings strife. It brings heartache between parents, between adults, between husbands and wives and churches. Walls are built. Sin always separates. But going God's way, asking in faith what it is, and responding in faith to going God's way always leads to life. And where sin separates, grace unites and strengthens and fills. Simple illustration, I, uh, one of those drives we have is, is, I believe, God's given us, just like a sex drive, hunger drive, I believe there's a revenge drive. You know, I get even. You never get even. Hey, God's given us a revenge drive, but it must be satisfied in God's way. It's a, it's a protective drive, all right? There's something we stand up to protect. It's all right. But now we have to realize that Satan's going to use that in it to get us to satisfy that in some God-forbidden manner. Where God says, if I want revenge, then hey, it's pretty simple. I bless those who curse me. I don't curse them back. Well, he cursed me, I'll curse him. That's not the way you get revenge. Not God's way, is it? They hurt me, I'll hurt them. I've got to learn that all-important word of Scripture, which is demonstrated most clearly in the life of Jesus, and that's that word forgive. And I don't, I, you know, I think we're probably never more like Jesus in our life than when we're forgiving, because he was assaulted, he was condemned, and he absolutely went like a lamb to a slaughter, without speaking, trying to defeat him. He defended him. He just loved all the way. And if we're ever going to be anything for God, then we have to have that same kind of attitude. I'm going to love all the way. I'm going to love all the way. But Brother Joe, that's not easy. No, it's not. But it's right. You don't know what they did to me. You don't understand what they did to Jesus. And God will, with every temptation, make a way of escape. And the way of escape is the cross. The way of escape is love. The way of escape is grace. The way of escape is forgiveness in that regard. We all come to that place. Every one of us get offended. We all get hurt. We all get disappointed, and people disappoint us, and people we, we commit ourselves to, you know, we get hurt by them. But if you lang languish in the pain and in the hurt, you know, and just live there, you're going to be miserable. And we think, well, the way to get out of this is to hurt back, but that's not the way Jesus gave us, is it? And it's not easy. It's, you know, when I got my driver's license as a kid, we had those big cars that look more like boats than cars, you know. Every once in a while you can still see them, big Cadillacs and, you know, Mercury's and Delta 88's and 98's and LTD Ford's. Remember those big giant cars? They are great, weren't they? Hey, not, you, you didn't get killed when somebody hit you in one of them. I get that much. <laughs> but they had massive cars. And were you, have you ever driven one of those big cars? It's not so bad now because they've changed the engineering and all that stuff, but boy, when the car would die, and you had to get off the road. You know, those hydraulics would go out on the steering wheel. And you, you couldn't turn me. It's like, you know, when you get your foot up there and turn it, you know, get this thing off the road. That's the way it is the first time you get up here doing them the way of life and you get to what we call hurt corner, you know. Somebody hurts you right there and it's time to pull over, you know. It's like tugging at that steering wheel that doesn't want to budge. But you know what? You can do it. It's, it's, it's a struggle. But God will, with every temptation, make a way. But here's what happens. Right now, you got these weak muscles. The stronger you are, it's not so hard, is it? How do you get strong? By going through that exercise. So you say, well, I've been there on that corner so many times, it ought to be power steering every day. <laughs> if you start choosing the right way, it will be. I know some people it is. They've been beat up by so many people, and hurt by so many people. It's got a one finger around the corner now. Just put the steering wheel, finger on the steering wheel, without the power steering. Because there's a power that's given them by the grace of God. It's not time. To, I don't know what we think we're going to get when we get saved. It's just going to all oh, be flowers and roses and perfume. It's just going to be wonderful. It's so good to be saved. 
It's hell by the acre. But you know what's happening? It's boot camp in so many ways. I'm growing. You're growing. You're getting stronger. Praise God. Look where you used to be. Look how far you've come. Amen. You're not where you were, hallelujah. But it didn't come by perfume and roses. It came by choices of faith in your life to obey what God was telling you to do in this situation. And that's why the temptation comes, is to bring you to that place. The other way is the alternative, and that's the enemy. And what's he going to do? He's going to destroy your life. He's going to ruin your life. You can live over there, and people dump their garbage on you. You can just dump your garbage back on them. That's not the way to live. In fact, I wrote this down. I don't know if somebody said it. I just wrote it. But there's something like this. We seek to dump our garbage where we've refused the grace of God in our life. God wants to give me grace right here. I can either fume out and spew out what's in my dirty heart. Or I can say, I'm not living that old life anymore. I have a new heart in Christ Jesus, and I'm a new man in Christ Jesus. I think I'll live over here instead. Now, as long as you live in this flesh, folks, as long as you're on this side of heaven, you're going to be tempted. Now, I really thought foolishly, well, I can't wait till I'm about 60 years old, and I've been through all these battles. I'm going to be so strong. Sometimes I look in the mirror and say, you're such a wimp. <laughs> in regard to my spiritual life, you know? If you feel that way at times? Like, the idea here is allow God to do something, something in your life. Remember, here's the, here's the way it works. It's, it's a simple process. A thought comes, because this is where the battle is, right? Where's the battle? Right here, right? The battle is right here in your head. Satan comes, that's why the Bible tells us to be renewed in our mind, be transformed in our mind, because this is where the war takes place. Put on the mind of Christ, you know, put on the helmet of salvation, because this is where the battle takes place. The thought comes, whatever it might be, just take your particular worst temptation right now, where you think you're failing in your own spiritual life. That thought comes to do that, what are you going to do? Well, a choice has to be made. By the way, the thought's not a sin. There's a time when I first got saved, I had some wicked thought coming out of there. Oh, I can't believe I'm like that. I can't believe I thought that. And I've learned really, I can believe I thought that. <laughs> Give myself a little too much credit in the old man. The old man never improves, all right? All right. Christianity is not patching up your old person, the old wineskins. Praise God, you get a new life. The other one's not worth fixing up. And this new life needs to grow in material. So the thought is not a sin, all right? Now, the desire that's aroused or stirred up, that's not a sin. That's a natural given desire. But Satan's tempting you to satisfy it in the wrong way. So a choice has to be made. A thought, a desire, and a decision. Choice. Here's the choice. What do I do, God? Now, some of you already know. You, just, you don't have to go to the seminary to get the answer, all right? You know what God wants you to do. It's, it's, it's obvious. And so I have to make this decision. So I go over here. Here's the thought, here's the desire. Satan comes, says, what I want you to do. I'm tempted Oh, that looks good. I'm going to do that. Sin. When this choice happens, then sin is conceived at this point. When you marry that passion and that thought to the devil's will, sin is conceived. When you marry it to God's will, righteousness is conceived. Victory is conceived. You marry it to the enemy, sin is conceived. Now, here's what happens. This act has taken place over here. Here's what happens. Next time I come to that place in my life, guess what I'll do? The same thing. All right. What happens when I come to it next time? Same thing. Some of you are stuck in that deal. That, that act produces a habit, basically. And the habit ultimately results what the Bible calls in a stronghold, an area where Satan's controlling and defeating you in your life. You have a stronghold. On the other side, follow me over here if you would. Here comes the thought. Flag should be going up by now. Desires is, 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 is popped up. Hey, it doesn't take us by surprise. We have a choice we can make, all right? God says there's always a way. There's, there's a will. You're going to have a, you have an opportunity at this point. You can say, oh, the devil made me do it. He can't if you're a Christian. If you're lost, you, you're, you're sunk anyway, amen? Get saved. Give your life to Jesus. But once you get saved, you can't say the devil made you do it. You can't say, this is the way I am. No, it isn't. You am something else now. That's the way you used to be. Yep. Okay, I thought you said that. 
If I do now with sin not being able to make this act, righteousness is conceived. Jesus is glorified. God is honored in my life. And guess what happens here? This act now becomes a habit, which becomes a point of righteousness, a stronghold for Jesus in my life. Where are these strongholds developed? Right here. They are strongholds of the mind. So the Bible says, bring every thought into captivity. Be careful, little mind, what you think. Be careful, little mind, what you think. That's where you're at right now in your life. So I would, here, here's the instruction for the day. <clears throat> you will be tempted. Multiple times. Pause for a moment. Look down the road. Where's it going? Just kind of visualize in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a spiritual sense, not in a new age sense. Visualize in your own mind what, what your life's going to be like when you obey Jesus. How good it's, you know, how much peace, how much victory is going to be in your walk. Versus get past the act, how am I going to be then? Most people can't see past the act. How's it going to be then? See what God's doing in your life. And see how he works in your life. That's why we can count it all joy, my brethren, and we counter different trials and temptations. Hallelujah. Go ahead and praise the Lord. It's all right. Okay, you're in church. Count it all joy. So text somebody. Say, I was tempted. I chose God's way. Hallelujah. Amen. I think sometimes we call that accountability. I just think of being brothers in fellowship in Christ. Amen. <laughs> Let people know what God's doing in your life. Don't think that... I'm spiritual, I'm never tempted. You're never tempted. It makes me wonder about your salvation. <laughs> Are you a Christian? All right? Because this is God's spiritual sauna. It's God's spiritual spa. God's spiritual gym. Work you out. Bring about righteousness. Hallelujah. We just stand with your heads bowed.